I'm Shanali Basik. I'm the Wall Street correspondent for Bloomberg Television. And I am so glad to be joined today on such an uh, enormous day by Stacey Cunningham, the president of the New York Stock Exchange. And Stacey, I do want to start with the elections in the United States. Now that we have a president-elect and we have a president that hasn't conceded yet and a runoff in Georgia, uh, what the biggest impact for you is while we have some answers and while we still don't have so many? Thanks, Shanali, and thanks for having me here with you today. I mean, certainly 2020 has been short of no surprises, you know, and we've had had lots of those to date. And I think we'll continue to see the election results, though, have come in. And, and that's something that we're seeing the market react to this morning prior to the news about the vaccine, which then really, uh, you know, it contributed to the, the major market moves to the upside. There's still some unknowns as we work through some of the details. But I think the big takeaway there was the the market was uh, reacting to the, the the view that the election was resolved. And so that uncertainty and being able to move on is certainly a positive with respect to market reactions and, and having that clarity. So that's, that has been well received by the market so far. I think the big story around our election here was the voter turnout, just seeing the number of people that voted in this, this election and how that's really eclipsed recent, uh, recent presidential election voter turnouts is a, is a good story, certainly in the U.S., now, with a time of such uh, volatility that we've seen in the last couple of months, how do you expect markets to be navigating uh, the choppiness that's ahead? We've still seen the New York Stock Exchange go through with a record amount of IPOs. And do we believe that now it's business as usual, the floodgates are open, or are there still some things that could upset this confidence? It's a really interesting time with respect to IPOs and market volatility. Traditionally, when you see volatility pick up in the markets, you see the IPO market slow down as companies would rather come out to the market when things are more stable. So you typically see them an inverse correlation there. What we've seen in 2020 was that following the extreme market volatility we saw in Q2 in, in the light of the pandemic and following you know, starting in March and then really continuing through for the next couple of months, we actually saw IPOs picking up. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that it was getting more expensive to raise money in the private markets and IPOs that were coming out to market were being well received. And so other companies that had stayed private and had been private for a really long time, but were large companies decided that now was the time for them to come out to markets. And I think there are a few reasons for it. One, you know, as I mentioned, how well received the IPOs to date had been, but two, there might be some turbulence that's extended in the market. And so if there is ambiguity around whether or not they'll always have that flexibility to go out, you definitely saw a little bit of remorse from some of those large companies that they hadn't been public already. So we saw at the New York Stock Exchange, September was the busiest month we had in our history for IPOs. And then October broke those records. So, so far, we've seen a really busy period of time throughout both uh, you know, for 2020, we saw a slowdown around the election, but we expect to see that pick up again in, in the, uh, later this year and then going into 2021. I want to get back to IPOs and some of the expectations ahead. But before we get there, I do want to talk about the election a little more because President-elect Biden has talked a lot about reaching across the aisle and making sure that everyone is working together as a country. But if you read through some of his plans, he also talks about public and private partnership as well. Now, the reason I want to ask you about this is because early in this pandemic, you personally have worked a lot with the city of New York, with the mayor's office, to create a lot of plans moving forward. How could the government look like if they're working more with the private sector to kind of move ahead to rebuild this economy? Yeah, I think we've seen throughout this year the fact that businesses have risen to the challenge to help be part of solutions going forward. And that's really a sentiment to, to take away. I think it's one of the real sil silver, line, silver linings and positive messages for 2020. So many companies without hesitation jumped in to be part of the solution. Across uh, the NYC list of companies, you just look at how many companies were creating vaccines or, or creating PPE, protective gear for so many that were on the front lines battling this pandemic in the hospital settings or providing financial contributions. So instead of just focusing on what their quarterly reports might look like and their earnings for their shareholders, they were focused very broadly on stakeholders across the board and how they could be part of the solution. That's a value in our capital markets and a value that we can raise money to help businesses fight whatever challenges might be facing our, our nation or our globe. 
And that's what we saw. Now, uh, President-elect uh, Bi- Vice President Biden is really seen and viewed as a moderate, uh, a moderate Democrat, and that he is somebody who is known for reaching across party lines and looking for solutions. And so I think that's what we would expect to see in his tenure as president is that he'll look for solutions and businesses are ready to be part of those solutions. So what during this pandemic have you found yourself doing as the president of NICE that you would not have done maybe in the past? I I think what we've been doing is we've been focusing on how to strengthen our community and give them the tools that they need to fight this unprecedented environment. So one of the things I wouldn't have expected I would have been doing in the past was holding a series of conference calls with our CEOs with with people like former FDA commissioner, Dr. Scott Gottlieb, who's providing information about how to battle a pandemic and how to keep employees safe. And, And that information has certainly been really what's been most useful for many CEOs this year as they're figuring out what are the right steps to keep their employees in, in a safe environment. And, and so many of them have been asking the same questions. How are, how are you handling the pandemic is a very common question to hear as, as you get on the phone with CEOs. So really thinking about those types of things, how they think about their workforces going forward, not just during the pandemic cycle, but just long term. This year really showed us a lot about the acceleration of digital transformation, about the not just the digitization of processes that exist, but really how people are transforming their businesses with the importance that they had to put on remote work and all of all of the different elements that go into their day to day. So many of them are taking that information and considering how does this redefine where they're going? And with every crisis, there's opportunity. And that's certainly a message that I hear. And we look at our own business. What do we learn from this and how do we want to continue to evolve? Because we do have opportunity to learn from everything that that occurs, whether or not it was welcome. Well, let's talk about remote work for a second. You were also one of the first New York area companies to start to bring people back to work. And now we're sitting here today on a day where Joe Biden has already started to create a task force around this pandemic. What would you like to see out of a national response for COVID-19 as we get through what he called this dark winter? I think it's really important to recognize that we've learned a lot about the virus over the past few months, and we've learned how to safely operate. So yes, there, there, there is real value in limiting the number of people that we bring together, but we can reduce the risk of transmission of the virus by the things that we've learned, like wearing a mask. So we reopened the New York Stock Exchange trading floor in May. We have over 400 people coming in uh, each and every day. They're wearing masks. They're social distancing. We put a lot of precautions in place to keep people to reduce the risk in the environment. And we haven't had any cases of transmission that yet, that we've seen on the trading floor. And that's because we believe that we've we've taken these precautions. And you know, we have had cases that we've screened that were attempting to come into the building. And so by using those measures, we've been able to reduce that risk. That's how we keep the economy open is by thoughtfully bringing people together in a way where we're reducing risk. And I think it's really important that we do recognize that some businesses are going to struggle if we can't reopen the economy. There are ways to do it safely. So let's use what we've learned about the virus, use what we've studied, but find a way that to focus our energy on the businesses that are most impacted. If there are people who are operating remotely without any loss of productivity or, or impact to the, to the overall economy, let's let them stay remote for a while. You know, I think we just need to use some uh, common sense and risk reward uh, evaluations as we think about which, which parts of the economy we want to prioritize, whether it be getting children back to school or businesses that, would, that might have trouble with, you know, withstanding long-term downturn. So speaking of the broader economy and getting back to work, we're seeing a very unequal recovery here and we're seeing potentially more damage ahead, even as things start to get a little better for the meantime. So when you kind of look across the landscape here, and we started to get at this before, but what is the role of big business as we look to recover? Well, companies are much bigger today than they were historically. And I think that's really important to recognize. If I look at the NYC listed company community, they employ 45 million people. So it's a logical thing for them to be focused on how to, you know, to have a role in, in recovery from, from this pandemic. And I think what's really critical is that we, we, we take that responsibility seriously. And that's what I'm seeing. That's what's happening. Now, the news today is really encouraging with Pfizer announcing their vaccine results. And the fact that they see a 90% efficacy, that's really encouraging news that there's going to be a solution. 
What's really critical is the timing of that news. And so that's the timing of how long we'll be able to get that vaccine in place and vaccinate a, a, in a broader population. And that's not going to be tomorrow, right? We, we, while this vaccine progress is unprecedented and, and Pfizer is not the only company that is making progress. So it's encouraging to see that there are a number of vaccines that are under production and will be coming. But there, it will take some time to get people vaccinated. So as I talk to CEOs that are thinking about their businesses, especially those that are most impacted by their businesses, uh, by the pandemic, it comes down to timing. How long can can they ride out, whether they're in hospitality or airlines or retailers? How long can they can they last until we have a vaccine? And so that's why it's so important for us to look for solutions that can protect the economy during that period of time until we can get the vaccination out there. You're seeing the market react today in a really positive way to the news that we, there is a light at the end of the tunnel and we're going to get through this. So are you saying then, if I read into what you're saying, that CEOs across corporate America, the people who, that employ 45 million people, that they should be responsible then for the distribution of the vaccines that are now being created? I, I think they're 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 part they're part of the solution more broadly. I didn't mean to say that they're responsible for the the vaccine distribution, but they're part of the, the the part of the solutions more broadly. And whether it be keeping their workforces remote to limit the risk until a vaccine is out there, uh, you know, and, and providing some infrastructure for their employees throughout that time so they can productively work remotely, that's part of the solution too, right? And when we just made the decision to close the trading floor back in March, I did it in part because we didn't really have a clear understanding. Of the risk profile around the virus, how it was being transmitted and how to limit that, but also because the healthcare system was under stress. And so I was making that decision that we should use our, our capability to trade fully electronically and remotely so that we don't add to the stress on the healthcare system. Those are the types of things that, that CEOs are considering. What are their actions and how are their actions going to impact the economy, the communities and society more broadly? And that's what we're going to continue to see. Working together with the government working together with the states, both states and federal government, is going to be part of that process. And we've seen that. You mentioned that I sit on the, the mayor's reopening committee as well as the New York governor's reopening committee, along with many other CEOs who have a vested interest in making sure that the city, the state, the country, the world is able to come out of this as strongly as we can. So I want to turn our attention over to the economy a little more now, because when you look at the stock market, uh, which, of course, is your business too, uh, very tied to your business. There was a report out earlier this year by Goldman Sachs that said the richest 1% of Americans now account for more than half of the value of U.S. equities owned, uh, owned by households. So when you look at the landscape more largely, knowing that statistic, how is it that so many Americans are not able to take uh, part in this, the wealth that's being generated by the U.S. stock market? I know you're a thought leader on this. And it, what is the number one thing that could be done to create more financial inclusion? We need to democratize access to opportunity. And, and one of the things that's really important to recognize is a number of the changes and policy decisions we've made over the past few decades have led to an environment that really reward large companies and large investors. We need to make sure that we open that back up so that smaller investors and smaller companies have those same opportunities and that we don't put too much of a burden on them. And this is an important issue because some of the very well-intended policy decisions that we make around incentivizing public companies to take certain actions or behave a certain way are, are, are great from a, a philosophical perspective and practical perspective but at the same time, it might lead to companies staying private longer, which leads the opportunities that exist in the public markets to be reduced. And so smaller investors aren't getting that same growth opportunity that they would have had if those companies went public sooner. And that's a really has a really significant impact on the bifurcation of wealth. So many of the, the fastest growing companies are staying private because it's harder to be a, a public company than it was 20 or 30 years ago. Because they're staying private, they're growing in the private markets, which means not everybody has access to those opportunities. They don't have the same transparency and disclosures and governance that a public company has. And so when they finally do go public, there isn't as much rapid growth in the public markets. And so while there are a number of investors, you know, there are the, the level of retail investment in 2020 has skyrocketed and we've seen a lot of retail participation in the public markets. That's great. We want to make sure two things though. One, they continue to have 
the best opportunities out there. And two, that they understand the risk profile because markets do move pretty quickly. And so if you're a retail investor and you're making a handful of trades a day, on average, you want to make sure that that, that, that risk profile is well understood when you look at market moves like today with 1,100 points in one direction. So uh, speaking of more participation in markets, speaking of regulation that could make people participate in markets to a greater degree, you know, one of the spots that will be hotly watched in a potential Biden administration is the SEC. I know there are ways of talking uh, about who that person might be. But at the same time, what are some of the things that the SEC and other regulators need to be looking at and doing uh, to to make what you're saying more possible? Are there easy fixes that could be made at the beginning? Yeah, I think it comes down to keeping decision making should be based on protecting the balance between investor access and investor protections. So giving investors access to opportunities, but making sure that they have the full information that they should have so they can protect themselves is really, really important. When we think about investor protections, there's the category of protections around financials and audit controls and making sure that when they're investing in a company, that that company has the appropriate oversight. And then there's also information that they w- that might just push for investor choices around uh, governance or, or around policies on issues like ESG. So investors are very interested in understanding what are the stances that companies take on a number of issues. Providing transparency into that is appropriate, but I, I get concerned about putting too many restrictions on it where investors might then lose access. So that balance is really, really critical. So we want to make sure that the SEC is focusing on transparency, having enough disclosures that investors can have uh, make make informed and and decisions that provide to that level of protection, but still maintain that level of access. And that balance isn't an easy one, but there are things that the SEC has been focused on that have been really constructive. One of them, I will say, that has been helpful is really innovating in the capital markets and looking at how companies go public. So traditionally, they were going public because they wanted to raise money. And we've all know, seen the amount of money available in the private market. So that hasn't been the primary driver for their going public anymore. Now they have secondary and tertiary reasons that have shifted to primary, like liquidity for their employees or currency to engage in M&A. In light of that, the SEC has said uh, has been open minded to some of the conversations around changing the way companies go public. So things like direct listings or SPACs have really been a, a part of the news story in 2020 as companies are looking for alternatives. That's been conducive to getting them out to the public markets. And that, that, those are the kinds of things we want to see the SEC continue to focus on doing. Well, let's well, let's talk about that for a second, because direct listings are something that you yourself have been focused on innovating on. And we've seen the model change. Uh, I want to talk about SPACs. For a second here, though, because record record volumes this year of SPACs, special purpose acquisition vehicles, and not a lot of proof of success in the longer term. So do you feel what what would take this to be a longer lasting, um, longer lasting thing in our capital markets rather than just a fad of 2020? Yeah, well, you're going to see a lot over the next couple of years. So when a special purpose acquisition corporation goes public, you're rate they're IPOing and they're raising money and the investors that are you know the management of the SPAC are really who people are investing in they're investing in the that, that business acumen and we've seen some of the brightest minds in business launching SPACs this year really across the board so they're going public then they're on a clock they have two years to go find a business that they're going to acquire at the time of that business combination that's how they become a public company but with a business combination so this year in 2020 we've seen a tremendous number of SPACs at a tremendous level of assets where they really raised a significant amount of proceeds year to date in 2020 list. And they're, they're out in search now of those business combinations. So we'll really see over the next couple of years with the quality of businesses that go public and how that continues to progress. That's where the, that's where the jury will sit. One of the things we hear from a lot of repeats back issuers is they're looking to get companies out public sooner in their life cycle than they would have otherwise done if they'd done, done it on their own. And so that, as I mentioned, would be a good thing for investors to have access to these companies early on. Really important to note that with the SPAC process, investors do get to vote and seed whether or not they want assets, uh, whether or not they want to approve the the business combination. If they want to redeem their their investment in in the SPAC, they have that right to as well. So it's continuing to evolve. The quality of SPACs we've seen this year, very different from SPACs of yesteryear. Frankly, when the New York Stock Exchange wouldn't even list them. 
So we've really seen a, a shift this year, and that, that's one avenue. I don't think it's going to replace the IPO. As we go forward, I fully expect to see companies choosing an IPO, companies choosing SPACs, and companies choosing direct listings. They each provide their own benefits uh, uniquely. Well, let's, let's talk about direct listings for a second here, too, because uh, I was on the floor last year when Slack was going public. Obviously, this year we had to watch it remotely when Palantir went public. We've seen this model start to evolve, but we've only seen a limited number of companies really start to use this model. Do you see the floodgates lifting and a much broader array of companies using a direct listing to uh, become fully listed on the New York Stock Exchange? So we had Spotify was the first one in 2018. It took a year to get Slack, which was the second one. And then we had two in September. So on one day in September at the New York Stock Exchange, we had two SPACs, two direct listings and two IPOs all going public on the same day. So I think that really is a, a testament to what we're going to see going forward. Where I think we'll really see some uh, acceleration in the direct listing front is when you can also raise capital. So when the initial direct listing that Spotify started, when they first went public, they didn't need to raise money and they were decoupling capital raising from the public listing. And the, the view of Barry McCarthy, the CFO of Spotify, was, wait a minute, we don't need to raise money, but we want to be a public company. Why do I have to issue shares at a lower cost uh, at a lower value out to the market. And then just to see them pop the next day, why can't I just raise capital separately? So he really asked that challenging question, provocative question. The SEC was open to having that conversation, which was a really great and progressive dialogue that we had with them over a year and a half as we helped Spotify come to market this way. Now companies are saying, but I do want to raise money. Well, it might not be the only reason I want to go public. It is a reason to have access to that capital. So we filed with the SEC to introduce a capital raise on top of the direct listing so that a company can issue primary shares at the time of their uh, at the time of their public listing. That will now really we've heard from a number of companies that that really changes the game for them because they do want to raise money at the same time. So as soon as that becomes a, an avenue that can be used publicly for companies, I think we're going to start to see it, be, it really start to break down some of the barriers that companies had with it. So also, I want to shift our conversation over a little bit, uh, as we only have a few minutes really left here, about foreign competition. Because if you look back over the last 12 months, the biggest IPOs uh, in the world actually didn't happen in the U.S. Many of them happened out of China. And, I, you know, I was back and we talked about this before when I was covering the Hong Kong Stock Exchange attempted takeover of the London Stock Exchange. There was this belief that some of the world's capital markets power could move further over uh, to the other side of the world. So what does this say to you that the biggest, biggest IPOs didn't come from the U.S.? What, what does it say to you that this kind of competition really exists out there? Well, we, the U.S. still, I mean, the New York Stock Exchange is still the number one in, in, in IPO proceeds raised you know, globally. So that, that hasn't changed our position as number one. What it says to me is we should never take that position for granted. And that we need to recognize, and it comes back to that same point I was making, balance between investor access and investor protections. If we restrict investor access in a way that companies are looking to list elsewhere because we have too many restrictions, then, then we need to recognize the fact that investors are going to go look for those opportunities and they'll, they'll support wherever they'll find them, wherever they might be outside, even if it's outside of the U.S. And so making sure that investors have access to the fastest growing companies is really an important part of that equation with investor protection. So one of the things that, that we've talked about is having the right balance on, on oversight and audit, fun, uh, fun, uh, audit oversight for companies that are listed outside of the U.S. That's critical. I, I, I'm not at all suggesting we should eliminate any of the investor protections. We just need to also make sure we're maintaining that, that balance with access. And so if companies are looking for alternatives, whether they're concerned about our, our legal system here as a, as a deterrent to listing or concerned about uh, you know, what, what access they might have to opportunities, you know, like we need to make sure we're keeping that in mind because you can't take your position for granted. Stacey, I do want to ask you a question also about uh, what's going on at home a little more, too, because. With the New York Stock Exchange and many of the other exchanges, there's a fight with New Jersey about proposed financial transactions tax, tra transaction taxes. 
Now, those taxes are something that there has been kind of rumbling about on a bigger scale also. Uh, how serious of an issue is that for you in New Jersey? And uh, how serious are you about moving your operations outside of the state? So I talked about a number of the businesses that have been impacted by the pandemic. It's true too for the states. So I completely understand why New Jersey would be looking to a financial transaction tax as a way to offset some of the costs that they've endured this year. That said, FTTs don't work. We've seen it globally that they have had a negative impact and, and trading just moves to other jurisdictions. And so we, we firmly believe that it's not a, a long-term solution. It's not a viable solution to the, the, the problem they're trying to solve here. One of the things that it's important to recognize, because we've been a vocal opponent to the financial transaction tax, it's not a tax on the New York Stock Exchange. It's a tax on the investors at the end of the day. It's not something, it gets passed back like other taxes do. When you go to a store and you buy something, that sales tax is getting passed back to the, to the consumer. So that would be the same case here, is that the investors would end up absorbing those taxes, not the, not the intermediaries in the system. That's really critical as, as they're already absorbing. They're, they would pay that tax actually twice because they would pay it in explicitly when they trade. There would be a tax on the trade. And then also implicitly in their execution price as market makers are setting those prices, which would be worse prices. So the investors would actually end up paying that tax twice. And ultimately, the fact of the matter is you don't need to be close to New York City or close to our trading floors in order to, to, to effectively match our trades. We can move our data centers wherever they are. So the New York Stock Exchange trading floor is in New York. We operate an options trading floor in San Francisco. Both of those floors have their servers and their and data centers in New Jersey. They could be anywhere. So one of them is literally across the country. We can move that to we have backup servers in, in Chicago. So we did run a test to operate from our backup system because our customers were asking us to. So this isn't something that the New York Stock Exchange is fighting for our own benefit. It's something that we're fighting on behalf of the end investor and because our customers are coming to us and saying, what are you going to do if these taxes come into play? And will we, you know, will you move because they're, they're interested in seeing that, that happen? So we're, we're reacting to customers and we're trying to make sure that we can educate people on the issue. And it's been reported that Texas, for example, is one of the states that has had conversations with you. Have you been having a conversation with a wider array of yeah, states yeah. to see what the backup plan might be? Yeah, almost instantly we started to hear, as soon as we announced that we would run a test from our backup data center, we had, I personally received outreach from a number of governors across the country. So really no, no, uh, no limits there, offering incentives to, to move to their states looking to see exactly what it would be that we need, asking if they could put forward proposals. So there's a lot of interest in, in moving. And I do think you'll see the industry look for a long-term solution that makes sense. Hopefully we can stay in, in New Jersey. You know, that, that there isn't, um, you know, like I, I would like to see that come. I, I, I grew up in New Jersey. I love the state. I, I don't want to, them to see, you know, losing that business that is there today. But it's Maybe I, I very much appreciate appreciate this uh, conversation with you and uh, hope to follow up sometime soon as we see kind of the fabric of the country really change as people start to make different decisions in different jurisdictions, really. Uh, Stacey Cunningham of the New York Stock Exchange. I'm Shanali Basic with Bloomberg Television, and thank you for joining us.